friends, welcome to Embracing Your Season. I'm your host, Paige Klingen Peel. Before I tell you about my guest today, I want to tell you all about Homeward. Homeward is the ministry that sponsors this amazing podcast. Homeward is a not for profit ministry reaching around the world to help families succeed. We would love to invite you to consider being a partner in this exciting and life changing outreach. Your prayer and financial support goes directly to make a difference in the lives of family. Your gift of any amount to Homeward continues to provide free podcasts, blogs, and the Homeward YouTube channel, and so many other family ministry outreaches. We believe you can reach out to parents and marriages and bring hope and healing that will change the trajectory of families for eternity. Your prayers and financial support is so important. If you feel led, we would love for you to go to homeward.com and click on the donate button. And now for my guest, Nicole Suvar. Nicole is a recovering perfectionist and intentional living strategist. P.S. I love that language. I wish I was an intentional living strategist. But guess what, friends? She's going to talk more about that so we can all become strategists in intentional living. Nicole found help and solace in focusing on small moments of intentional living in everyday life. She encourages others to quit the distraction of anxiety by finding their own small moments of intentional living each day. Nicole has been published in Proverbs 31 devotionals, several online magazines, and her newest book, which you absolutely have to check out, is called Numbering Our Days, Combating Anxiety and the Power of Small Intentional Moments. Now, just as a reminder, stick around to after my conversation with Nicole, because I'm going to share a few of my takeaways from our conversation. All right, it's time now for my interview with Nicole Suvar on this edition of Embracing Your Season. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Embracing Your Season. I have an amazing guest with me today. Her name is Nicole. Nicole, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. It is great to be here. I'm Yeah, I'm so glad you asked me to come along. Well, what's so fun about our relationship is that I was speaking at a conference locally and I was talking about um, assisting clergy, like uh, helping prepare them and equip them to handle mental health struggles in the church, Um, a topic that I'm very fond of, you know, because I work in a church and I'm also background, obviously licensed therapist. And so we were talking about all sorts of things like uh, brain chemistry and brain development and mental health struggles, anxiety. And I shared kind of a little of my own story of that. And afterwards, you came up to me and you're like, girl, we should be friends. Like, I totally understand what you're talking about. And so then we ended up getting coffee and I heard a little bit more of your story. So I would love to just start there. Tell us a little bit more about your story, who you are and kind of where you are today. Yeah. So one of my story would be one of those like long time ago when I was a little girl. <laughs> Yeah, way back way, in the beginning. Go, way back, yeah. My Actually, my first memories of being anxious are back when I was like eight years old. Um, I would have what I didn't know at the time, but it was kind of the start of like anxiety attacks in school. Mm-hmm. I would just, I would have sweaty palms. My uh, breathing would be really shallow and my heart rate would be going really fast. And I would, I didn't really know what to do with them other than to just try to act as normal as possible. Hmm. (laughs) So So it was a lot of like just shoving them down. Um, And I would have a lot of sleepless nights. I didn't sleep real well. I, it was so hard to fall asleep. I would often come down um, two hours after bedtime, not having fallen asleep with all these different worries. Um, The ones I could actually name would be things like, I was actually worried about the ozone layer way before anybody else was concerned about it. I was so one of those- you had climate change. I, I was. I was concerned about climate day. change very early. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> That's the one that stands out. I was so worried that the ozone wow. layer was going to disappear. We were all going to die. Um, for sure thought that if I fell asleep, either a fire was going to co- was going to take over or a tornado was going to come. Oh, a my. lot of these just like heavy feelings. And then sometimes it would be, I couldn't even name it, but I just- felt anxious. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I would, I would tell of my parents, they, I, again, I want to say this in the fact that I do not blame them because I very much know they were using the tools. They were doing the best they could with what they knew. And what they would tell me is like, that's not that big. That's no big deal. Don't worry Mm -hmm. about it. Don't worry about it. Go back to sleep. Or if I would try to describe it 
at to the teacher at school that I was worried about something. And again, it would be the same thing of don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal. And then giving me the solution of moving on. And so through the years, that is was the message I heard is don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal. So mm. that's just what I kept trying to tell myself. And it, when I was realizing that like, okay, that is the only solution I have. I can't stop worrying. I guess I'm just gonna have to shove it down so that I can't feel it as well or do all these other things so that I didn't feel it as much. So I was very active. Like when it came to high school, I was very active in like all of the sports, all the activities, um, all the after school and before school things. I was straight A student. Like the teachers loved me because I was always looking to do all the things to be in control (laughs) Mm -hmm. because it kept Mm -hmm. that anxiety uh, stuffed down. I want to say it did not go away at all. It was still very, very present and kind of what was driving me. Um, never was it like anxiety was not even a word. It was just, I was the worry wart of the family. And it was kind of a joke that like, you don't have to worry about it because Nicole already has, which is mm-hmm. true. I've thought about every worst case scenario on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and so yeah. what I even am hearing in your story too, is just the power of language. Like mm-hmm. everyone, including yourself was just don't worry about it. And mm-hmm. how often we use that language, but not knowing that that is reducing the validity of your intensity of the emotion you're having. And that way, now I think we're on the flip side, everyone's calling everything anxiety and depression, right? And so, I mean, we've like oscillated from the extremes Uh here, but for you to grow up to know that you shouldn't be worried about anything. And I know you came from a Christian home. And so even having that connection with worry Mm -hmm. and your Christian faith, like how confusing that probably was for you. Yes. And in fact, like as I grew old, older and then I became a Christian and there was then that facet in that I was like, if I would ever do say that I was worried about something, it would just come back with a scripture. Well, you know, the scripture says, don't worry, be anxious about anything and all things, you know, yada, yada. And uh, every single verse that said anything about worry or fear, I at the time very much felt like more like a condemnation because I just, I couldn't get it. And I was like, clearly I'm missing something in this Christian walk because Mm. I can't get to that point that all these verses are saying. And so the shame set in. And along with the shame means I'm just, again, I'm stuffing it down. I'm not talking about it anymore because it's just going to show that I don't have my act together when it comes to being a Christian. And I, like, that is how I led, lived life for until my mid thirties. Like that is how I existed. My husband actually had no clue. I mean, he could say definitely that I was a bit of a control freak and a perfectionist, (laughs) but he did not know the level of anxiety that I was holding inside because like, I just, it was what, at that point, it was just how I lived life. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and you were successful too, right? Like it's not yes. like you were falling apart and you're yep. staying in your room and you were in the fetal position. Like you were out doing things. And I think that's also the confusion with worry, anxiety, and all of these mental health struggles is that we have very high functioning people that have mental health struggles. And you were demonstrating that. Yeah. But you recognize that the perfectionism and the control was actually a coping mechanism, like a survival yes. tactic, because the anxiety was so intense for you. So at what point did that language like change for you where you're like, okay, this is an issue. I should probably work on this. Yeah. The tipping point was what, when I was like 36 years old and it was New Year's Day. And usually New Year's was actually a really hard time for me because I would always see like this whole last year of all these things that I didn't get done. And uh, this next year of all the things that I should get done. There's just a lot of shoulding mm-hmm. <laughs> that I mm-hmm. put on myself. Um, and again, it was like fueled by that because I was just always feeling this bit of anxiety that something else should be, I should be doing something else and something better. And I was standing alone in the laundry room, folding some towels and it just, I just broke down and started sobbing. And mm. I, I the, in my mind, my, the thought that entered my mind is like, I don't want to do this anymore. I would be better off if uh, my family would be better off if I didn't exist. Wow. And wow. that kind of became the line in my head for a few weeks. And I finally, I told a friend that I was, that was the thought I had. And she said, you need, you need to call the hot, you need to call a hotline. You call a counselor, you need to do something. Um, and the, the church that I attend has a, has a, like a hotline that you can call that can, they'll just 
talk through things with you. They'll recommend counselors. They'll recommend doctors. And it's when I made that phone call is really what, yeah, that kind of was that next step. Cause then they recommended, I, they're like, it was the first time I had anyone tell me that what I was feeling was not normal. Hmm. Wow. Wow. How old were you again? 36. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. But it was also the first time I really voiced out loud what it was all, what it was going on inside me. Mm-hmm. And for them to say like, actually worrying like that is not something you can just stop. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's the first time anyone's wow. ever told me that. <laughs> like what the freedom that yeah. that in the validation, yeah. right? Like, yes. oh man. Wow. And so tell me more about that journey. Like what happened after that confession? Because I'm sure you didn't want to go, right? I'm sure that that shame was speaking over you. And -hmm. then you pushed through that. Yeah. There was a lot of relief once I I saw a doctor and started just describing how I was feeling. And um, they diagnosed me with a generalized anxiety disorder with major depression, like acute episode. And to have a diagnosis, I was like, uh, that was like another shock. To me, then I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. this is a, is this an actual thing that you can be diagnosed with? Yeah. And then started seeing a counselor. Um, I was on medication for a time to just start balancing out all the things that were all the brain chemistry mm-hmm. <laughs> that was going on. And what the doctor even then had just had um, helped me see was that for I was living with that high anxiety for so long that I had depleted all of that. Um, the serotonin. So I was, the depression is really what took me to see a doctor is because that was the part that scared me. Cause I'm looking around. I'm like, I love my husband. I love my children. We're all healthy. Um, I, I enjoy my job, like all these things that it didn't add up. And that's really kind of what scared me. That was like, then why am I wanting to end this all? Hmm. Yeah. So it's, I'm so glad you pointed out the fact that like it was, so important for you to get the treatment because oftentimes people continue to live in that pattern where they're not seeking help. They just Mm -hmm. try to grin and get through it. The bootstraps, like Mm -hmm. it's very much like we have to push through. And then if we throw in the spirituality piece of we just need to pray through it and we just need to have people pray for us, Mm -hmm. we need to read the Bible more. Like then that adds a different level of shame because Mm -hmm. we're not getting the healing. But I just, I just want to clearly say to all the listeners that there is such a thing as a chemical imbalance. So Nicole's story indicates this, that she was having a physiological reaction with her heart beating fast, where she couldn't breathe, where she felt overwhelmed with her thoughts. They were rapid. That indicates a physiological response to too much something in their brain. Usually it's the cortisol and it's Mm -hmm. the fight or flight and it's all of that Mm -hmm. stuff in your chemicals. That is nothing she's been able to control because it was something either she was born with or it was something that her brain just didn't develop in a healthy way. So there is nothing wrong or broken about someone that has a chemical imbalance. May you all hear me right now. There is nothing wrong with you, even though that's counterintuitive because there is a brain chemistry <laughs> issue. <laughs> but we all have something that is in our bodies that isn't the way that it was supposed to be, that God wanted ultimately for it to be designed because we live in a fallen world. So some of us have certain chemical imbalances. I certainly do in my brain as well. And so I think it's so important that we preach that message. I know, Nicole, you're passionate about that as well. It's like, please know seeking help is so valuable to get you out of that valley. And actually evidence shows I just read this in a scientific um, journal that evidence shows, as you indicated, Nicole, with your own body and chemistry, that if we are not treating the chemical imbalance, something especially like the fight or flight consistently, that can lead to adrenal fatigue. It can Mm -hmm. lead to leaky gut. It can lead to all sorts of heart issues, um, brain issues, all because our body is not in a, in a, a good place because it's constantly in a fight or flight stance. And our bodies can't sustain that. So we'll start being depleting of the feel-good chemicals. Mm -hmm. Getting the treatment, getting the medical intervention can actually help our brains navigate that. And we don't always have to be on the meds. That was the other thing I talked to, like even with kiddos, like um, you and I discussed, like I will be honest, my daughter is very much like me. She has um, anxiety. She's had it since she was a kid, a young child. I've had it since I was a young child. It is better for us to treat their brain chemistry at this age as its brain is developing because then it helps that buffer 
Because if we don't, then it's going to create that depletion of feel-good chemicals, not even just mentioning the social impact if they're constantly in a state of fight or flight. So uh, again, I'm on my soapbox. I'm just so passionate about this. Nicole, I know you yeah. are as well. It's just educating people like get help. And truly, it saves lives, right? Yeah. You're, yes. you're a great example of that. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, I was on it for a time. I'm currently not on any medication. Um, I'm managing it in other ways. But mm -hmm. even just for that short time, what it did was was quiet that voice that I could not, like that it just kept speaking over everything. Even though I would try to control these anxious thoughts, the, it would, the voice was so much louder and it mm -hmm. just kind of quieted some of that. So I could start thinking rationally. Yes. Yes. And kind of come so back good. over the top of it with like, this is, no, this is God's truth. But when you're like, when it's, when you're in such a hard spot, all you have is those irrational thoughts. And it's so hard to speak through it if you're in a, yeah, a really crisis state. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about your your kids. Like, how do you speak about your own mental health struggle? Um, because they're witnessing it as well. So, like, mm -hmm. how did you walk alongside your kids and explaining kind of your own experience? Uh, yeah, I, I very, I'm very vocal about now. If I am having a hard day where I'm just feeling more anxious, um, sometimes, like I said before, I I can with generalized anxiety disorder that is generalized anxiety. Like you feel anxious and you don't necessarily have anything to point it to. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can, you can kind of follow the route and find out like, oh, it's this thing that's coming up that I'm nervous about, or this person said this thing to me and now it's been bothering me ever since. And But sometimes it's just that general feeling and sometimes it's higher than others. And um, it can even just be like hormonal can make, make it ebb and flow. And so I just am sure to like, be very upfront and clear of just being like, guys, I'm just, I'm, I'm having a more anxious day today. So I'm, I might be, I'm trying not to be short with you, or I'm trying to have a little bit more patience and just being vocal in that, that like, I'm not making excuses for myself or any kind of bad behavior, but I want them to be aware that if you're going to come with me, like with a bunch of stuff all at once, I'm going to need to be given a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. if we are a daughter who like comes to me and like, she said, she wants them something right now that we have to do with this. And I often will tell her like the actually, I, I need to like move slower because the faster I move, the more anxious it gets me. So if something's making me feel like we need to rush, that's actually when I need to pull back on the reins and we need to move a little slower. Ooh, and that's good. it could be like my daughter be like, will want something to happen a little faster. And I have to remind her, I'm like, actually, we need to move a little slower. And you know what? We're going to be okay. It actually is like speaks against how I want to operate too. So I learn along with her, but just like training that, that taking out some of that urgency that doesn't need to be there. There's a lot of stuff in our environment that makes us like, makes things feel like they have to be urgent and mm -hmm. they really aren't. <laughs> Well, and that's one of the things that your book talks about, right, is intentionality. And and I love this quote. It says, you desire a life that has meaning and purpose, but you find yourself caught in a current of nonstop rushing. When this becomes your existence day after day, you find you've lived a series of months, even years unintentionally. Do you know how terrifying that statement <laughs> is, but how true it is? I yeah. mean, tell us a little bit more about trying to live intentionally. Yeah, I think it goes like what I was saying about like that uh, uh, caught in that current because we, we just kind of, you, our days are spent by whatever comes at us. And then that's kind of what we deal with versus mm -hmm. planning out. Like, these are the things that actually I want to see happen today. These are the things that have to happen today. Like sometimes it's school things or work things or, and intentionally building in things that, um, bless our souls, bless others, things that, and mm -hmm. weaving those into the things that, actually have to, that are priorities and also filtering out again, like those things that are they urgent or are they not, are they urgent to somebody else? And they're making you feel like it has to be an urgent thing. Um, yeah. So I think just being intentional with thinking through prioritizing, but I think often, or a big thing for us now is I'm going to say it screens like, mm. yeah. I th and I think we all know it, but we just kind of don't acknowledge it. Or we're like, oh, nothing we could do about it. And so we have a spare moment and we're like, we, what do we do? We pull out our phone and we just scroll and scroll. Oh, look, there went 20 minutes. And suddenly we're feel like, oh yeah, I have no time. I have no time to do anything. Like, well, you 
you did. You had 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sure did because you just saw everything on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> and and so I cannot see it. Yeah. And the thing is that doesn't happen once in a day. Like there are multiple times and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, that there are times that like there's actually large snitches of our day that we have spent wasting. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying like we can't have any of the downtime, but it's almost being more intentional with that downtime that we have. Um, because if we don't, if we aren't, if again, if we're just being swept along by whatever comes at us and we're just dealing with whatever comes at us, we, we are, we're living those series of weeks and months and years of just dealing with whatever comes at us. And there's, what have we lived? I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm in a season where my my daughter is a senior. Mm-hmm. And so this whole mentality of like series of months and even years have I been intentional with her? And I and I feel like I have. I can certainly look back and be like, "No, there's tons of times where I haven't been." But how much more it's it's come to light that I need to be intentional. I have one year with her where she is my own before she goes off into this big world. And mm-hmm. so it just comes to light to me that that can cause pan- panic as well. Mm-hmm. It's like, what am I going to prioritize? Am I making sure I'm doing the right things? So any wisdom on that? On like, how do you choose why? wisely in what to prioritize, especially when there's that balance of, I have a job, I have my mm-hmm. kids and activities, I have church, I have, you know, and the list goes on. Yes. Yeah. I also have a senior. Um, I have three high schoolers, just so if anyone's listening and they're like, oh, well, it's so easier for her to talk about being intentional with all the, every single moment of your life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course. Like, like, what would you know about that? <laughs> yeah. It, I think it can be sometimes a hard thing to hear though, is that We do, when you have to be intentional, it's meaning that you're looking at like, what time do you get up in the morning? What is the first thing that you do when you get up in the morning? What are you doing with that time of like just during the breakfast and the lunch prep while you're trying to get the kids off to school? There's things that you can weave in there that can, again, like not only bless your soul, but bless others. It's, it's really, it's about the human connection. Um, like I said, like in my book, I talk about the fact that we need to tie things to eternity. So the things mm, that we can start wow. looking at that are eternal, like those are the things that we need to prioritize. Well, what's eternal? Like it's our souls. Like that's the only thing that's going from here. And so we're talking about humans. <laughs> so prioritizing the humans in your life, whether it's like building, helping build that community around you, if it's the people in your core family, it's your uh, co-workers, it's other students that you're with and just being intentional when you're with them. So again, that's like screens are away. Um, when you're in your home, what are you doing to build your home? That is a safe space for people to land. Um, what are you doing with just your own thoughts? That is like a big one with like just being intentional with how, what you're thinking, you know, about yourself, about others. Are you often jumping to conclusions? Are you very self-critical and critical of others? Do you hold very high expectations, um, not only for yourself and others? How do you handle that and communicate it? Yeah, I think it's taking, taking a step back and, think, and looking at through your day, things that you're, are making you anxious. How are you looking at to at that in the light of like temporal because often when we think temporal that's what starts mm-hmm. making us anxious because we're looking at the here and now it has to get done we have to hurry up but when we step back and we're like this is just a tiny bit of a very huge picture of eternity mm-hmm. and it kind of just gives us more of perspective and it doesn't mean that we don't still have to get some things done or we don't have to address a hard situation but if you're if we're bringing Jesus into it it yeah that makes all the difference Hmm. And so the connection again of being intentional and how that reduces anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. Like how much that correlation um, is so powerful in the day to day. And I think there is something about, as you indicated, when we are engaged in relationships, that helps reduce anxiety and depression as well mm-hmm. because we're made for community. We're made yes. for relationships. But that intentionality piece, I love the whole um, the time of day. So there was a season in my life where I love sleep, by the way. Like, <laughs> That is one of my favorite hobbies when people ask, what's your hobby? Sleeping and reading books. That's it for me. (laughs) And so I knew it was going to be a sacrifice to get up before my kids at around five o'clock. But because I knew I needed that Jesus time, 
uninterrupted, which doesn't often happen when people are awake in my home, I made that decision to get up at 5 a.m. There really is a 5 a.m. for those that still sleep in until like six. It's true. (laughs) So I started doing that. Now for an entire season, I'm telling you, I was so fulfilled. And it actually started a season where I transitioned from my previous practice of counseling full-time into full-time ministry, something I never saw. And I never would have had that transition, never had that closeness, never had that even just prompting unless I was in communion with the Lord. But Mm -hmm. it took that intentionality of getting up early because we do have all the time in the day. People talk about we don't have enough time. No, it's how you choose to use it. And so speaking of devotionals, let's talk about your book and how you have devotionals to encourage people. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, this book is was born out of my healing. Um, I'm 42. So that kind of gives you, like I said, 36 in the last six years of once I had a diagnosis, once I had some medication in me, started seeing a counselor and started, I, I started to realize something that was helping me heal was being intentional. And because when we are anxious, again, like I said, we can kind of, we look too big out into like, or this whole day, this whole day, it feels too overwhelming. There's no way I can get whatever I need to get done. And we, we get so anxious that we almost will shut down and just yeah. don't do anything. And then what we do actually is like, we try to dis- we end up disengaging and we're on a screen or whatever versus what I found was when I started breaking it down into just the moment in front of me, what do mm. I need to do right now? And sometimes right. it was just the getting out of bed part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know I need to be intentional with this right now. And it's maybe it was saying a prayer as I was um, getting up, as I was getting my coffee. Sometimes all the prayers I could get out were what I could have read in a psalm. A psalm is a great place to find um, things for when you're depressed and anxious. Absolutely. I love David. Yeah. I can David relate wrote to a David. lot of that. Let's go. <laughs> and sometimes like that's all I would that's all I read was was a prayer out of Psalms. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it was just being intentional with like again, the person who was right in front of me. Or if I was struggling with a thought, being in right there, I'm like, this is the thing I need to address right now. It's just being right here. I'm not everything else. I'm going to pause for a minute. This is the thing I'm going to work on. And when we're starting to look at just these small little things, then you've finally gotten to a whole day where you've done a, just a number of intentional things. And look at this, you've gotten to the end. And so that's mm. kind of, I started I started writing these down as I was starting to see them in my in my life. And it slowly turned into a devotional. So I, I looked at like seven different areas of our life. Like as I was going through the day, those were different areas that I would be intentional with. So it was the heart and very much like what you had just said is like beginning with God and just mm-hmm. tapping into his word, um, being intentional with our thoughts, being intentional in our home, not only like how we, how we um, design our home to be welcoming or safe or with hospitality, or there's a lot of different ways intentional with our time, with our health and with our money. So that could be, that's a, could be a huge one that could just cause anxiety. Even if somebody who doesn't necessarily struggle with anxiety, that one can be a big Mm -hmm. one for them. And then also our relationships. So I broke that down into like seven different areas and the devotional each has seven different um, devotions inside each of those areas. So it could be read as like, oh, I just run, read, uh, excuse me, read one little bit today, or you can like read a all about the health chapter or all about, yeah, however you would mm-hmm. let it break it down. But that's good. And I love that it's holistic, as you said, because it's like we're not single faceted people. There are so many content pieces in our life. There's so much being poured into us that we need to focus on the big picture, the mm-hmm. whole thing. And so I love that that you have those areas that you focus on. And and again, you're using your own experience, which I, I just love because people can relate and you can relate to them and there's value in that. So I would love for people to find your resources, to find your book. So where can they find all of that? Yes, I ha- uh, on my website, livewithintent.org. Uh, they can sign up for my weekly email. I send one out every Friday morning, and it is it gives you an intentional thought, an intentional prayer, and then an intentional moment. There, I purposely write them nice and short, so you can just breeze through them in a minute or two, but it's something that can encourage you to 
maybe look at just another little spot in your life that you can be more intentional with. It could be someone who struggles with anxiety. It can also be someone who doesn't necessarily, or if they have someone in their life that does, it can kind of help shine some light in that area as well. Hmm, that's wonderful. Well, thanks, Nicole, so much for this conversation. It's uh, been a blessing to me. I'm certain it has for my listeners as well. And you've equipped them with tools and ways to practice and and a great reminder to be intentional, to be so um, – what's the word I want to say? Ugh, we're going to edit this part out. This is where I'm telling you that this is where I don't sound smart. Um, be so intentional. To be so intentional holistically on all the areas of your life and how, yeah, you bless your heart, you bless your soul, and you bless the people around you. So again, thanks so much for joining me today, Nicole. Yeah, this was great being here. Thank you, Paige. Friends, I hope you are picking up on how awesome Nicole and her story is. Uh, just going through how it's the anxiety started as a young child and how she didn't even realize that this was a diagnosis that could explain the rapid thoughts, the rapid heartbeat, the way that her body responded to circumstances through anxiety. At the age of 36, man, what an amazing testimony. I know I was encouraged to hear how she has now transformed her life and even just teaching others how to be intentional and that in itself combats anxiety. So a few of my takeaways. Number one, what is the difference between worry and anxiety? I know anxiety is a big buzzword. I love when kids throw it out there as if it is a diagnosis for themselves or their parents. The reality is anxiety is an actual medical diagnosis that indicates usually a chemical imbalance that is happening within the brain where they're not making enough feel-good chemicals and there's an overabundance of fight or flight symptomology in their bodies so that we'll see that they are thinking too much in the future, that they're overwhelmed by the circumstances in their life, whereas worry and stress is absolutely a part of daily life. But the difference is it should not incapacitate you. It shouldn't be such a, um, it shouldn't control your thinking. It shouldn't control your relationships or how you live your life. Worry is one of those things where we can kind of stuff it, where we can add truth to whatever lie or distortion or stressor that we're focusing on, and that will help eliminate or reduce the amount of worry that we're experiencing. On the other side, anxiety, that is something that actually needs potentially a medical intervention, not just necessarily medication, but there is evidence that shows when you go and see a counselor and you talk through some of the things that your body is experiencing or the body is thinking through, there can be a huge significant decrease in anxiety symptoms because we're taking back control of our thoughts, we're reducing the stress hormones in our bodies, and we're able to live a less stressful life through our thinking and our relationships. So I so appreciated Nicole talking about how she went from thinking she was only worrying to honestly being a medical diagnosis that she ended up getting help with. And that's the other aspect here too, friends, is that you don't have to do this on your own. Too often we feel like we invalidate ourselves, our feelings, what we're thinking and experiencing, and so that we don't share it with others. The moment we share it and open up, it gets us out of isolation. And then we start realizing this isn't something that should be common for us to experience. And that's when intervention can happen on a really positive level. So friends, I'm here to tell you, go and get help. Talk to your spouse, talk to your friends, talk to someone at church and open yourself up because it's the isolation that can increase and cause more problems in your life with your anxiety and your relationships. So reach out to those that are close to you. My next takeaway is talking about intentionality. One of the things that we can do to combat anxiety is be more intentional, not controlling. Now there's a difference, right? Like we in anxiety want to control to reduce anxiety. That's not going to work because frankly, we can't control the world around us. Thankfully, we have a good, good God that controls everything and we can trust that he wants our good and that he will take care of all the details. However, 
God does say that we need to be smart and good stewards of our time. So ask yourself, how am I intentional? What am I prioritizing? How much screen time am I doing throughout the day? Am I making choices that bless my soul and bless my relationships? As Nicole said, those are good questions to prompt you to ask Am I being intentional? Because when we prioritize ourselves and we prioritize the relationships that matter most to us, you'll actually find that the mental health benefits greatly outweigh all of the lack of sleep or screen time or whatever sacrifices that we've made in order to achieve those intentional priorities. So those are some of my takeaways today. I really hope that they are encouraging to you. I hope that you can implement them. And I hope that you can see a reduction maybe in some anxiety or depression features that you might be experiencing or take care of some of that stress and worry that you might be having throughout your day. I just want to thank you so much for listening today. If you have any feedback or guests that you would like to see on the show, I would love to hear from you. So you can always reach out to me at pageklingenpeel at gmail.com. We have a lot of exciting interviews coming up, so be sure to stay tuned again next time for another edition of Embracing Your Season. 